and there's this little thing over here that I'd like to see more of. Do you see that? And, and then you'd step away and, she, and then you'd say something like, well, and I'm actually not sure I see that. Um, and, but the flap itself, the conceit of the flap, you knew that you were onto something and that you wanted uh, to work with that. And, and it changed colors um, uh, every time it came in. And it, it changed textures. And, um, and sort of, um, uh, those were long conversations about why, why each time. And it was sort of a new, you know, like, uh, it was, well, what, what's Flop going to look like this time when I come, when, when I come and visit a couple of weeks uh, later? Um, and it, it did. I mean, it looked pretty awkward for a long time. And I knew it was going to be really good because you were giving it so much. You know, you were, you, you were just obsessed with it. It's interesting because you know there's really not much there, right? I mean, it's just as big. It's big, and it's really thickly textured. And so you have totally this you know, surface with texture there, and then nothing except this flap and the shadow that it, it casts. Um, and and it became very clear that the shadow and the space. I mean, that the flap and the, the space under the under the flap is really what it was all about. But I had to kind of put all the stuff in and take it out. I remember it many times it looked like a giant pop tart. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it, 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 yeah. <laughs> were you thinking about Bessemer uh, when you were thinking about Flap? I mean, I loved the moment. Pop tart makes me think also of when you called her work like a beach towel. And I, I actually think that was, a again, a very refreshing moment because these things do have their fine art connotations, and then they have their very vernacular association. No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Actually, not at all, because I wasn't, I mean, it was a flap, and the flap came very much out of a particular type of canvas that I was using, which was sewn and stitched, and I stitched two pieces of fabric together with a flap. And I was using the back of the canvas, so I, too, am very interested in the back and undersides of things. And in using the back, there was this flap in that, and I got engaged in it. Just in that. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. Boy. <laughs> well, I, I don't know how to explain it yet, but all I can say is that it's less about. I, I, quite a while ago, I mean, about a year and a half ago, I realized, I mean, I do still work with grommeted straps, but I'm not that interested in the straps in the way that we were discussing it as that sense of, of, of binding, bondage, of holding something together, bandaging, of that constraining, uh, and yet it's loose enough. Um, so that's there, and the painting surface remains the same, but I've become more interested in the grommet holes as, if you think about grommets, they're in the um, reinforced areas of tarps. They are reinforcements from holes, and they're about connect possibilities of connecting, tying down, um, or even connecting. And so I'm interested in them conception visually, first of all, because they open up the painting surface to what's underneath. So the pushpins that come out, the grommets that open up the painting surface, visually seem to. But I'm also interested in the other associations about being uh, reinforcements for connections or possibilities of connections because they don't all connect to anything or the connections are pieced very apart very easily. I also think of very much about the paint as a skin of paint, and therefore the painting is a painting body. And therefore, if you start thinking, when you think that way, then the grommets are orifices in the painting body. And so I'm very interested in the, the, the body orifices in this abstract way as being places of passage. And so now, in the most recent work, um, and so I've known all that, that's there. But I've started making um, grids, large, at scale, of uh, grommets, of grids of orifices. I <laughs> mean, you know. Um, and they're, again, they're regular, but they're not regular. There's a kind of thing of the grid is, in all of its histories, there. And yet, uh, it's grommets. 
moments, you know, and they, there are these openings. Except that the grommets are actually in a piece of canvas that then is affixed to a stretched canvas. So it looks, there's something visually, I don't know, in some more formal way they're about some kind of space or something, because it looks like they're open and deep. But they're really not, because you could, but you could tell at the same time that it's affixed and it's flat. So there's tensions, there's things, things that you kind of read several ways and you know and they don't quite make sense. And I don't really know a whole lot about that at this point. <laughs> Tears, I wanted to ask you a little bit about clustering these works of harmonies under the rubric of the monochrome, because obviously this is a question for you too. Obviously the monochrome in the 20th century has had this very specific polemical history, going back to Blavich, Rochinko, not only as a kind of end game, you know, sort of the end of art, that's always the monochrome that announces the end of art, but also it as a kind of revolutionary form that has some, um, you know, just seems to promise something for so many different people in so many different historical moments. And I think you, obviously, the works are in dialogue with the monochrome. They're also very not monochromes, you know? They're so varied in their coloration. There's so much about leakage and porosity and you know, feathering out. I mean, there's just so many other things going on. So I think I'd love to hear you talk about kind of staking your claim in the monochrome history there. I guess that kind of goes back to Harmony's assertion that um, that, that monochromes are a central uh, kind of guiding principle, that monochromes are, are, are not about um, emptiness or, 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 or the void or the end of anything, um, but, but, but are um, the result of a, uh, of a process um, and um, of, of, of a certain, uh, certain kinds of materiality and that, that it's an effect, um, clearly. Um, in, 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 as much as the, the black square is an effect, uh, black is an effect. Uh, so, so to, to, to emphasize the, um, I think, indeterminacy and, and um, not the absolute of, of the monochrome as we've kind of inherited that idea, um, but, but the indeterminacy and changeability, the relationality, um, and sensuality of, of, of the monochrome, and it's it's um, uh, it, it's it's a different um, <coughs> these paintings of harmonies, both the weave paintings, the early paintings, and and the later um, more monumental scale work. Um, they 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 have a physicality, and and, and they have a relational um, a sort of magnetism, and they change very much in the effect of them, uh, changes very much in um, relation to the viewer's proximity um, and um, to, to the light and um, to, to the locus of the, of the view. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that that, that sense of, of, of a negotiated relationship with an object that was created by a, a, a negotiation with another body, that of the artist, uh, comes through in, in, in both those early works um, and in, in the later monochromes. And a really, um, I hate to use the word pure, but it's a really pure way. Um, and, and, and there isn't any, just there, there is less distraction from that, I guess, in, in, in these works. So that becomes something that the, the embodied relationship um, with the object and the material becomes something very palpable, very visceral uh, in, in both cases. And, and, and that seems that arc of time and that continuity within um, Harmony's work, because that's true of all the work. Um, but these, these two things seem to uh, uh, sort of resonate um, in space in ways that, that um, uh, um, made that knowledge really accessible to, to the body walking through the room. I so would just add on to that, that for me, you know, this, like Teresa said, I don't think of monochromes or the end game. I don't think of it as blindness or the other uh, 
signification and imaging representation. Because those notions of monochrome don't really take into account the sense of materiality and how the materials themselves can be carriers of meaning. You know, the texture, the surface, which is all important in any kind of monochrome painting. You know, kind of indexes the materiality in a certain way. Um, so my, I guess what I've always tried to do in all the work, but especially in the monochromes, is how can I bring, I mean, for me was how can I bring content into these works? How can I bring content into monochrome painting? Through materials, because what else do you have? You know? So we're left with color. We're left with the, all the paintings, the textures are not the same. That big painting flat that's peachy, it's that the texture is very thick, and yet there's something about the painting that's kind of light. The dark ones, uh, which we didn't go into at all, the dark ones with the rib with the two ropes hanging there, and some other dark ones, the surface from a distance looks black. Up close, it's you're not sure what color. Is it a beautiful dark blue, dark green, and some variation of black? It's a, what I call fugitive, fugitive color. So I'm interested, and this is where for me the notion of clearness comes in, that the surfaces and the colors are what I call fugitive. You're not sure what they are. Or like Teresa said, they change with light. They change as you move closer or further away. And I'm using fugitive in all that, you know, all of its meanings, kind of outlaw way of bringing content into this modernist monochrome painting field, but also, you know, a kind of, of you can't locate it. It's here, there. Where is it? Now you see it. Now you don't. Moving around. So it's not fixed, which is a strange dialogue with these paintings, which have a huge, a lot of paint and a sense of materiality. They have a sense of unfixedness about them. I know we have an eager audience, so maybe we should open it up to questions or comments. It's a kind of tipping the hat to um, Deleuze and Watari and um, the, the, the notion that every becoming, um, process of becoming is equally a process of unbecoming. And what I like about that, um, I, I, I like that formulation um, in, in thinking about also about learning um, and every process of learning is also equally a process of unlearning. Um, so it, 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 it was meaningful to me in, in that way, but also just happily, that's how Harmony describes the work. And, and we've, we're both kind of steeped in um, these theoretical traditions that have been important um, to queers and, and, and to feminists um, that, um, um, and place emphasis on processes rather than results um, or outcomes. Um, so, so becoming unbecoming um, in that way was the kind of theoretical um, dyad. And then the, the unbecoming, um, unbecoming of just, you know, so word my grandmother used to use, that's not very becoming. You know, that is, in fact, unbecoming. Um, that sense of, of, of not, not, you know, not looking quite like you're supposed to look. Um, I also like that kind of uh, double sense. There's like a rudeness, you know, yeah. or like an unsightly, you know, or like unconventional. You know, you're not quite, you're not quite conforming. I think I use the word, and, and I love it for those reasons. <laughs> um, but I think I use the word becoming, the words becoming and not becoming initially because it's hard, you can't see in these images, but uh, 
um, the monochrome is Chersis's, what I call near monochrome. And that just means when you get up close, that there are underlayers of color that begin to push through the surface. You can't see it from a distance. It's perceived as monochrome. And you get up close, and one of the things that happens up close is you see under colors that are slightly revealed or pushed through this, what I call the surface under stress. So there's always, and it's true of the early works as well, there's under colors. It's always about what's layered, what's covered, what's underneath, and what's revealed, and is the under, what's ever underneath pushing through the surface. So one way I talked about these monochromes, in fact, I didn't call them monochromes, I called them near monochromes, is perhaps they were becoming or unbecoming monochromes in that sense of process that we were talking about. Anyone else? Um, I, so I just 